Welcome to Shamba Chef of Uganda. We are traveling all over Uganda to find hardworking farmers. We want to celebrate them while giving them the knowledge they need. To make their farms more productive and adapt to climate change. We want to support them to get better yields and increase their income. We will see how farmers can benefit from our experts' advice and turn their farms around into a profitable business. While learning from each other in so many ways. Join us on these journeys and share in the farmer's experience. On the Shamba Shape Up Uganda! Uganda. They said the black gate. But it can't be the only black uh, gate in the uh, Black ladies first. Thank you. Uh, yeah. This looks uh, like a, a men's meeting no, or something. No, this is Charles. <laughs> are you sure? Oh, Mr. Charles! How are you? Welcome. We have arrived. Yeah. Yes. I'm not the Charles. I'm a trainer. Oh. Oh. So this is Charles here. Oh. Yes. Mr. Charles. I'm Charles. Okay. How are you? Bye-bye. I'm Mrs. Christine. Nice oh, to yeah. meet you, oh, madam. Thank you. Uh, from? A gift from, from Shamba Shepa. Oh, oh, Shamba Shepa. Yes. I always hear from you. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> I see you from uh, the TV. And what is going on? Uh, this is Chiwanuka Foundation. Oh. We are under... Uh, a training. Oh. These are farmers who come always and train from here. Hello. Hello. Charles Chiwanka is the founder and chairman of One Acre Foundation in Busebi village, Iganga district. Charles and his wife Christine participated in the 2019 Best Farmers Award in Uganda and were chosen as one of the 13 best farmers under urban farming. I was inspired by the award. So we came up with an idea as a family to have Chiwanuka One Acre Foundation. You know in Ibsoga here, because of the land fragmentation, where the urban, all very deep in the villages, people survive on small pieces of land. So I thought that was a bit uh, tricky, and we started bringing here groups of people, especially women and the youth, to teach them how maximally they can utilize those small pieces of land, but sustainably. Charles himself has seven acres of land and his farm also serves as a training ground for the farmers in his foundation. He grows bananas, pop holes, citrus trees and has planted elephant grass on two acres. He also grows vegetables and even experiments with intercropping. And he has cows, of course. But I want to know why a cartographer by profession who's been a businessman and a politician at the district level, becomes a farmer. Since my childhood, I was copying this from my parents. So they used to take us very early in the morning to the gardens. So since then, I got passion to farming. The foundation aside, Charles wants to focus on dairy farming. For now, he has four cows and two of the cows are in calf. His aim is to get 20 liters per cow per day, but currently he's getting only 14 liters per day from just one of them. So we're still very far from his plan, but our expert from the National Agricultural Research Organization, NARO, Dr. Brian Owesijire, things are not so bad at all since his cows are in calf. This is good mm -hmm. because once an animal is in calf, mm -hmm. that means very soon mm -hmm. they are going to calf and very soon he's going to have milk, more milk. But he needs to plan well. These animals, they are still in the early, early months, mm. and that's why he's still milking them. Okay. But the later stage is going to stop, oh. and at least when it is nine months, that means around six and a half, mm. seven months you should stop milking. So that you give it two months to concentrate on the, on the baby. But I was doing a very grave mistake. My own practice was, I only stopped milking a month to... No, it was wrong. It was wrong. That is too close. Because while we are milking, we are milking energy. Also, the mother also again needs energy, energy. to maintain the, 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 the fetus, the baby, mm. the calf. Is there a, sp a special diet? What do I do? Remember, it is coming from, from a journey of where it has been struggling. Struggling how? It has been almost uh, trying to satisfy three different areas. Trying to satisfy itself, to survive, 
trying to satisfy the baby to maintain its to maintain up to term. Also trying to give you some milk. So now when you stop the milking, now that means the demand on the third window you've closed it. And now we are also very close to do the nursing. At least start giving some forage, not only on this, this napier. Not only on this napier. You are now going to start on even including, including some regimes, very good ones, like lab lab. And you also need to go and get some concentrates so that you start feeding your animal, nursing it, preparing it, walking the journey for the next, for the next two months so that the animal will be happy, will have the, all the energy to give birth, will also have energy to prepare even for the next lactation cycle. If you are waiting to feed an animal very well to improve milk production, when it has given birth, you are too late. So when I stop when I stop milking at around seven months, uh -huh. the ma the animal will be will say, "Oh, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Now you've reduced my demands. Uh, Let me start preparing for the next milking cycle." Oh, okay. When do I start milking? Ah. Could be I am making another grave mistake. Once an animal has carved down, oh. you start a business. How you are going to milk it? to get what we call colostrum, and the whole of that one you're going to give it to the calf. But you don't give it, don't put it to the market. For human consumption. For human consumption. So, depending on your animal, immediately at least after one week, that's when your milk should go to the market. Okay. But make sure, immediately after calving, milk that animal, and make sure that calf enjoys that first milk. And again, that milk helps the calf to survive health-wise. So, give it its appetite. But you must also include the mineral leak. Maybe if I may ask, which, which sort have you been using? Here, where they eat from, I've been using this type of salt. Th this is salt? Yes. I thought it was a rope. It is a type of salt. A rope? This is salt. You mean, doctor, you have never seen such? Certainly I have seen, but we've moved away from that. And now we are using what we call a multi-nutrient block. So it's not only salt, it has also other nutrients. Meaning there is something missing here. Very. That's why now we encourage farmers to always use a multi-nutrient block. And it should be provided all the time. Ah. So that they keep on leaking it. And that's why we also say animals should have water all the time. Charles has planted two acres of napia or elephant grass on his shamba and it is what he feeds his cows exclusively. It is all very fine, but Dr. Brand says it's not nearly enough. Dairy animals are not only going to depend on napia. Mm. They also need some, some other grass species, which are very rich in crude protein. For example, this napia has about 6.5% of crude protein. And these dairy animals for completely need almost close to 30% mm. of, of crude protein. So that means they are lacking in crude protein, but you can still achieve it by now bringing on legumes on board. And there are, there are a number of them. Mm -hmm. But the common one which we are actually recommending for this zone is, is Lab Lab. Lab okay. Lab is very Lab good. Lab. Okay. Within three months, it will have matured. Oh. Then you can also put maybe another grass, like for example, Styrosansus. It's another legume. You can also put another grass like Centrosima. So, if we integrate that, these animals are going to now get all the energy which they are getting from, from the napia. The napia. And then, plus. in addition now, plus what they were lacking from the crude protein, they are also now going to get an addition from the regimes. Any challenges? Of course, the challenges are my men who harvest this for the animals. Mm. The way they cut, oh. they think this is a very hard problem, problem for, them. for them. But we, I understand them. Usually when you are cutting this grass, mm. it should make sure it is very even. Mm -hmm. Don't again cut one stem which is still up, then another one is still short. It should be almost at, all at the same level. Same level. I'm not saying you should get a tape measure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so that when they are also sprouting again, they are oh. also, you are getting a uniform grass. Uh. And again, when even you are feeding it an animal, mm. you co you'll confuse it. Some <laughs> will be a little bit old, and then another oh. one will be still very young. And then it will also have some other implications. Are those animals that animal. intelligent? <laughs> animals have a brain. <laughs> they are very intelligent. Yes. They're even selective. There are those ones which they pick first, which is very palatable. And are those ones which will 
will pick last mm. after coercing them. That even those ones which they will not even pick, they, will, they can even choose that they will rather starve and die. <laughs> so that preference is also there okay. and it usually brought about by our presentation. Oh, now I get it. That is why earlier Dr. Brian made such a fuss about how the napier should be cut for the feed because the cows themselves are picky. Oh, no, 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 no. No, it's, this is not a very good way of cutting napier because he needs to be cutting very, 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 very small, at least a maximum of like maybe an inch, so that the animal can always pick it very fast while feeding. So is this okay? This is not fine. This is not fine. Still, maybe something like this. Like this? Ah. Yeah. Dr. Brand came with a machine that can cut napier into very small pieces in no time. Of course, not everybody can afford it, but he's here to show us how to make silage and the machine is of great help. That we're doing this in order to have pasture available during the dry season. So that means when that time of scarcity comes, then you can always open up and feed your animals on silage. Now, when we're making silage, you need to have the chopped grass. Remember, it should be harvested at the, at the right time. Like now, the napier you saw. Yes. It was very red, three months. Harvest it, mm -hmm. have it chopped, mm. small. It's not more than an inch. Oh, pieces. Pieces. And then, once you are set, you also add in additives. Additives here, we're talking of the molasses. So molasses is the best? Yeah, it would be the best because the napier, which you are using, has got very low levels of crude protein. Yes. Now, when we use molasses, molasses are very rich in crude protein. It is actually an excellent source of crude protein for the animals. Mm -hmm. Now, the next thing is, how are you going to store it? The best way to store your silage is to make a polythene sheet which you tie at the end to make it airtight. You turn it inside out. Your tube can have a maximum capacity of 600 kilograms. You fill it with your finely chopped napier, 2 times 70 kilos of grass, then make sure it's well compacted. You then add a first layer of molasses, a mixture of three parts of water to one part of molasses because molasses is quite thick. Ensure an even spread of the molasses mixture over the grass. You repeat until the bag is full. Then you tie its top tightly, leaving inside as little air as possible. To maintain the compression on the material, place weights such as stones on top. But remember to store the bags off the ground away from pests. The molasses will enhance fermentation and your silage will be ready in 21 days. If it remains tightly sealed, it can go up to even five years. You have your silage all the time. You'll be confident that you have enough feeds for your animals all the time, which is very good for a farmer. You don't panic. In whichever situation you are, you can't panic. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, so, it's a, yes. you've had Charles all morning. I came to work too. Uh, yes, and, well, and Charles, what is, the, what is the problem? Uh, 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 Mr. Charles, uh, 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 from later. Uh, the, the, Charles, we, we uh, have to talk about something. No, I uh, did uh, the, the part break. So, so uh, the dairy production, I think, is on the right path. Hmm. Uh, it, it makes economic sense for you. Yeah, but I think we should get men into hot culture. As well? Yeah, uh, actually, it's, that's it's a way to go. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a new a thing now. Makes a lot of sense. Okay, so makes why is it not opening? Hello? We are in Busei B village in Iganga district and we're visiting a multi-talented farmer, Charles Chiwanuka, on his seven-acre farm. We've seen how he can prepare his cows for bath and how to make silage. We'll now see if his experiment in intercropping sukuma wiki with peppers is the right way to go. We will also take care of his citrus trees. He definitely needs advice on management. Hello? Uh, <laughs> Caris, Caris, open. Caris, Caris. Charles is experimenting on his seven-acre farm. He tried to maximize a small plot by intercropping sukuma with peppers. He also wants it to serve as a demo for the one-acre foundation farmers. But are these two crops compatible? Let's see what our expert in horticulture, Alfred Otim, has to say. 
But this look nice. Yeah, they look nice. Mm. Yeah, they look nice. But uh, I sense a bad coming. Okay, well, sometimes you can intercrop so that the one crop benefits from the other. But these two, they have a problem. Skumawiki belongs to the family of the brassicas. Those are cabbages, that is cauliflower, broccoli, uh, spinach. Their commonest uh, pest is aphids. And one of the bigger problems of uh, green, pepper. green pepper is also aphids. So when you intercrop the two, this one, the skumawiki will feed pepper. green pepper with aphids. So for you to produce anything, out of green pepper, it will be very costly in terms of buying chemicals, paying for people who are working there. So the output will be low in most cases. Okay. What aphids do in reality is they suck from the apices of the plant, the shoots, they suck juice, and that sap contains hormones for growth. So once they sucked off, they are not growing, they don't have shoots to produce and the leaves become crinkled so that if even if you take to the market nobody will buy they say this could be gm leaves or something like that if you put onions there mm. first of all they are they don't grow so high the other thing is they don't compete so much for food they repel they that uh, smell from onions mm. it repels aphids, aphids. And then the other thing is that the uh, uh, pepper is tall and the uh, skuma is a bit low and yet all of them need light. So pepper will uh, overshoot the uh, skuma and cast a shadow on the, mm. on the skuma. So the, the skuma does not get enough light. But from my eyes, it looks all good. <laughs> Look at how leafy these skuma wikis are. Yes, the blessing you have is now because of rain. When, the rain, when it's raining, aphids are beaten off from the plants because with aphids the moment you do this they fall down mm. yes so that's what rain does and it beats them and kills them and it, so that is one advantage uh, farmers can take to plant this leafy vegetable during the rains other than the rain mm. what is the other remedy as far as this garden is concerned we have uh, adopted the use of uh, what they call neem oil. I don't know whether I... even neem trees themselves. Those neem trees are all over. So how do I apply them? When you get the seed, uh, you, then you grind them, mix, mix them with water, you and apply there. You spray? You spray. You can also add hot pepper. Eh? It drives all those insects away. Oh. If you put it, apply 20 grams in that mixture of a half a kilogram of seed crushed in 20 liters of water. So it should be sprayable, it should be able to come out of the pump. Okay. Yes. Usually when you are, before you start spraying, you have to carry out what they call scouting to see if there are aphids under the leaves. Under the leaves. The moment you see like, between 5 and 10, there is a certain percentage, it's called a threshold, yeah? which prompts you to take action. Below which, just go and enjoy your, whatever mm, you are mm, doing mm, at mm, home. That one. At my level, I thought it is okay, and I was better about that. Scientifically, he was correct, but I learned from him. So next time we shall not mix, we shall be planting X pieces in a different piece of land. A few years ago, Charles planted citrus trees in his garden. They were doing very well in the beginning. And during COVID, people were advised to top up on vitamin C. So lemons were precious. Our farmer had a steady stream of buyers. But then, things suddenly went downhill. The trees stopped producing fruits. Those uh, citrus trees are a problem. You benefit from the first, second and third year later you get a disaster of those trees. By the way, not only me, I have so many friends of mine, and they are miserably crying because of the loss. Our expert Alfred Otim is not surprised. He sees many problems with these citrus trees, but the main culprit is poor management. Citrus grows best in loose, loamy soils. 
but this soil has a certain level of clay which is restrictive to growth of the, uh, of the roots. However, that does not mean you cannot produce oranges here. In this case, what failed you was failure for you to carry out some managerial activities. For example, they are yellowing. That is a sign that they have lacked nitrogen. Nitrogen is one of the nutrients plants used for making chlorophyll. And you know chlorophyll is used for making what? Food. I don't know when last you applied the manure here. It's a long time. <laughs> yeah. But especially when I got disappointed, yeah. I gave it a blind eye. Wow. You needed to <laughs> get back to that practice. May I get the hope from you that if I applied the manure, although these citrus trees, especially this lemon, doesn't do well in this area, will I get the required goals I want from these fruits? True, you will get it. What does manure do to the clay level in the soil there? It breaks it, the effect of stickiness is removed, it becomes soft, so the roots flow easily, so there you are likely to get Good better harvest. yield. And how much quantity of manure do you apply? You apply two basins. If you don't have enough, apply one basin. But the maximum is two basins per season, the season of rains. Remove all the weeds below the canopy. After removing those weeds, then now you apply manure. Uh -huh. You are removing those weeds so that they don't eat your manure. Yeah. Yeah, because if you leave them there, they will compete for they the will compete. They even, they even on the surface, they will eat before the, the nutrients go down there. Mm. Number two, is you need to control diseases. There are some diseases you can see here. Eh? These are what we call fruit spots. Mm. Fruit spots cause premature abortion of the fruits, meaning the fruits fall down before they mature. This one you are talking about mm. is everywhere. Mm. What would be the remedy? It goes along with the poor management. The moment you don't apply manure, at the moment you don't uh, attend to uh, other management practices, like for example, removing the affected fruits, you will see them there. As long as they are hanging here, when rain comes, it will wash the spores from those affected fruits to those down which are not affected. So it means you have to do what? To remove all of them there, bring them down and bury them. Now, the other aspect of it is uh, pruning. There are branches which are very high that uh, you cannot easily manage the tree. Like Such activities like spraying, such activities like uh, harvesting, so you have to cut them down to a manageable level. And then also you have to remove dry branches. Those dry branches hold uh, fungus uh, which cause this fruit spotting. And there is a disease which comes during dry season. It is, uh, attacks the oranges during dry season and attacks the top parts there causes what we call die back. So the plants begins dying back from the top. Ah. So, and those, uh, that disease stays, when it is rainy season, does not attack. And it remains there on dry branches, praying that I, I wonder when will my situation will come. When dry season comes, it attacks. So you remove the what? You remove those branches because they are like a store, a reservoir, they are hosts for that disease. So that is what you have to do. Uh, those are the three key item, I, uh, ways to, to bring these uh, oranges back to life. to life, to production. Before the end of July, you will see all green life here. If we followed what he told us, of course we are going to try it. If it is achievable, then the, the community will benefit because we shall be passing over the knowledge. For Charles, it's all about community and the farmers in his foundation. He loves farming and puts it in the service of others. And I hope our experts helped him do that. So, Frob, it's time to say goodbye. Uh, Charles. Yes, please. We had a really good time here. Oh, it's a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, it's a pleasure. Been, you've been my inspiration. Oh, oh my that's God. it. <laughs> nice to hear that. Don't mind him. <laughs> safety and thank, thank you. you. Wishing you a safety and Yes, thank you, bye sir. Bye. <laughs> Do you know why I said that? Why? Do you know this road is called Chiwanika Road? I had. When I grew up in one year, when, I'm going to when? own the road. Oh. Hey.
Wani ya? Wewe agi forget this. 